<laughs> a few weeks later, when they do the next in your house, that whole weekend was a, this, now this is post in this interim time. Sean gets jumped by like 175 <laughs> Marines or something at the, uh, at the bar. We're in Germany at the time. We had already known when I left for Germany, I knew Vince had already told me and Sean what he wanted in the match. He wanted me over, uh, and then WrestleMania for the world title would be chin music. Me, Vince and Sean were to fly in like Tuesday of that week to work on something really spectacular. So I got back from Germany like Thursday or Friday night. The next day I was, I, I get a phone. Wait, wait. The first night I'm home, I get a phone call from Davey boy. And, you know, Davey was also like a gremlin, like to stir the pot. And he said, uh, Hey, I just want to let you know, uh, uh, while, while you were gone, Sean's been telling everybody in the dressing room, he's going to embarrass you on the pay-per-view. Well, I knew what, it, what, what he was doing. I just didn't know the reason if he made it up or if it was legit. And I said back to him, I'd like to see him try. I'll stretch his ass on that pay-per-view. And that was the end of the conversation. The next day I get a phone call from JJ Dillon saying, uh, uh, hey, Vince doesn't need you and Sean in on Tuesday now. Uh, he'll just see you when you get to this weekend. And I said, uh, why? I mean, something happened? He goes, well, no, Sean's had a relapse of his concussion. I said, how did he get hit in the head again? Because remember, this is my the time of my medical school training, right? Said, how did he get hit in the head? He goes, why did he get hit in the head again? He just had a relapse. So uh, I've had the phone call with Davey. Less than 24 hours later, I get a phone call from JJ. Changing all this. And I'm like, oh, okay. I can see what's going on. Well, I can't do anything to change it, right? So I just flew in. Jim Cornette and I flew in on the last flight the night before the pay-per-view. And I was rooming with Dustin. He'd already checked into the room. So I got up now. I'm packing my bag. And there's a note on my bed. It said, uh, we're all waiting for you in the bar. So I got done unpacking. I go down to the bar. And the bar was, as I recall, packed with people. And sort of dim in there. And I see two hands going like this over the crowd. So I look and I see it's razor waving me over. Now, by this time he and I were already doing this. So I thought, okay, that's strange. Uh, but I knew one thing about razor was if, if he's been in the bar for any length of time, he's been drinking. And if he's been drinking, he's going to stooge something off, you know, he'll, he'll blab. So I went over and he had, a, he was saving a chair for me. And he goes, Hey, I just wanted to slur in his words. Just want to tell you, uh, congratulations. I said, congratulations for what? He goes, well, you didn't hear from me, but you're getting the belt tomorrow. Okay, now freeze there. The only people that should be aware of this match and what the finish of this match is are Sean, me, and Vince. So I'm wondering why is he even telling me this? You know, it, so I said, well, okay, well, we'll see, what, we'll see what's going to happen or whatever. I, at that moment, I didn't know if he knew that Sean wasn't performing or did. I, I mean, in high school, I'm guessing he did. And, uh, so now I've not seen Sean since we've been in Germany and we had this whole battalion of Marines beat him up. And, uh, so when I pulled into the back of the building, Sean pulls in right next to me, literally at the same exact time. So I'm expecting to see somebody beat to hell, right? I mean, like you've been beaten up by that many people, like a you know week or so, you're going to still be showing some signs of it. He gets out of the car, fresh as Daisy. And as we're walking in, I was talking to him about, like I say, her had a tough time in Rochester, blah, blah, blah. And we get to the dressing room entrance and the makeup girls are across the hall. Sean, I go left into the dressing room and Sean goes right into the makeup room. About a half hour, 45 minutes later, whatever it was, I get on to get a coffee and Sean comes out of the makeup room at the exact same time. Now they've got them all made up, right? He's got the bruise on his face. He's got a contact lens in there. I, said, I, I remember making a joke of something, saying something like, uh, man, those makeup girls must be tough, huh? And oh. <laughs> and laughing at it. And I go down and get my coffee. I then get called to Vince's office, which was the local, uh, uh, I think it was Regina uh, hockey team. Every town has a, their own pro, semi-pro team. Went down, knocked on the door. He told me to come in. I opened the door and it's, almost pitch black in there there's i don't know if you've been in the locker room like that when they turn the lights off there's always like one security light that stays on so this is like dim very dimly lit room and vince is sitting at a card table right under that light bulb so we sit down and this is my first time talking to vince since being told that sean's not performing he's had a relapse of his concussion we don't need to be coming tuesday 
this is my first time seeing Vince. So he starts telling me about how great my promos are and what a great heel I am and blah, blah, blah. And uh, then something, somehow he blurted out, but it's never, I think it's, we here in the world wrestling federation believe. And what he said was that the fans should always go home happy. We in the world wrestling federation believe the fans should always go home happy. And I said to my honest opinion, I said, I would disagree with that. He was really why I said, was well, a heel that's drawing a lot of money, sending people home pissed off and seeing the fervor the next time from them and their buddies that they brought with them. I said, I believe it's, it's, there's ample evidence to send the fans home pissed off once in a while. And, you know, he agrees to disagree and, you know, and he made points back that the other way. And, uh, and he said, you know, he's like, like in hindsight, it was like, he was buttering me up, like the, like the throw some pile of shit onto my plate. And I said to him, let me, let me stop you there. I said, uh, here's my philosophy on the business. You sign my check. So you tell me what you want. Now I would hope that after this many years of being in the business, if I give you a countervailing view, that you would listen to it. You may or may not agree with it. But if you tell me, no, I appreciate that, but I want it this way. My answer to you is going to be, okay, you sign my check. And he goes, well, I appreciate that. And he said, so tonight, you know, I want you to go to the ring and he, I want you to cut one of those scathing promos you do. It's okay. And at that point, Sean's going to come out in his street clothes. He went, okay. Because I have no idea what we're doing at this point. Like, like how are we going to get through this, right? <clears throat> and he said, uh, and at that point, Gorilla Monsoon is going to force him to relinquish the title and give you the title. And I went, oh, my exact words. Oh, my fucking God, please don't do that. He went, what? Why? I said, Vince, I said, I've heard every wrestling champion growing up and since I've been in the business say, you'd have to pry this belt from my cold, dead hands. Or until I get a bump on that, then I'll just hand it over to you. I said, I'm sure you can do it. Chin music. Have him super kick me while I'm doing the promo and cover me. One, two, three. Do the match when the match could be done properly. I, was, oh, I appreciate that. We're committed to this. And he, now we're sitting here at this point for about 35, 45 minutes talking. Me and him alone in this room. And he goes, I want you to grab that belt and you hold it to your chest like it's the most covetous item you've ever held in your life. He goes, then at that point. So <laughs> we're in this dimly lit room. I'm looking at Vince. I'm like, what the fuck's he doing with his arm? So I look at his shoulder. He, he keeps his arm out there. So down to his elbow, down to his wrist, down to his fingertips. I'm thinking, why does he hold his arm like this? And I keep looking. And 10 feet to my right, Scott Hall is sitting in one of the lockers in the darkened room. I looked at Vince. I said, what kind of fucking game are you playing here, Vince? He goes, oh, no game, no game. But, you know, and at that point, Ray's going to come out and Ray's going to beat you for the belt. And I went, oh. And so you don't see that the fans will be smart enough to see and realize this is a baby face to baby face belt drop. It's going to damage Scott and it's not going to be very welcoming to, to Sean who claims to be, you know, the, the heartbreak kid. Then he's going to give his friend the belt until I can get back. And it's horrible Vince, but I'll do whatever you want. He said, we'll do whatever finish you want to do in it. I said, there's only one thing that makes sense. I said, as he's pinning me, on the two count, I slide my leg under the bottom rope, which would then break technically the count. Now, as a heel, I can get up and say, Scott Hall's a cheater, blah, 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 keep my heat. He goes, great, we'll do that. So we go out, we do it exactly as laid out. And if you watch, <laughs> saying it this way, it sounds like I'm putting myself over, but exactly on the two count, my leg slides under the bottom rope except the announcers don't even comment on it. Right. And so I thought, okay, lesson learned. You got me. You won't get me twice. And, uh, you know, it just started like a, there was a, what the precipitating factor was in it. I don't know, but I know it started around the time of the Montreal thing. And, you know, quite frankly, I've never been one for screwing any of the guys, especially for wanting to do exactly what the boss said to do. So, uh, I'm sure that was like the initiation of it. But then, I, like these guys, and it wasn't just me. Like everybody thinks, like okay, well, we can just point the finger here. There was a lot of that going around. I had, uh, later seen Ahmed Johnson uh, a couple years ago. I think last year at, at an independent show in California, 
Uh, and he told me right after I left, they turned on him. Uh, there were a lot of people in the dressing room they were doing this to. Now, at what point you got to say to Vince, like, okay, Vince, so either you're fine with this stuff happening, you're, you're bringing the guy like me in, you know, allegedly telling me you got a million dollars wrapped up in the launch of this character. But then pissed whenever I stand up for myself and say, I'm not going to keep doing this. I can't afford to keep doing this for 6,400 bucks. Um, it, it just seemed all of it in hindsight seems strange. And, you know, I, I think more like when I hear different facets of the story, or I talk about different facets. I can see clear as day. This was done intentionally. And then there's other times I think, well, maybe it was just sort of something that just sort of happened and just sort of morphed into that. But it, Take a few steps back to get the more macro view. Look at the promos that I was laying down on ECW, hammering WWF and WCW, challenging their champions to shoots, um, and and getting it over. The ECW was getting over, was building at this point. So to me, it makes far more sense for the conspiracy theory that vince did this intentionally he gets the mouthpiece of ecw away from ecw and shut up in this monotone voice talking like this boring as fuck um and then pulling shit like that in the ring a i was aware of it when scott was doing it in the ring i was aware of it when sean was doing it in the ring um and i again in hindsight i'm, I'm more certain than not that vince was either willingly duped into this and if so, shame on him or he was part of it, shame on him and shame on them, you know, because like take me first of all, it did not, it really refreshed my batteries going back into ECW, uh, being away for those six months was, and I tell people this all the time in the gospel truth, the absolute of my 40 years in the business, this Thanksgiving day will start my 41st year of those 40 near 41 years. Now that was far and away the worst six months I'd ever spent in the business. The money was the worst. Uh, the experience was worse than that. Uh, and there, there was no fun to it. Like, so finally going back to ECW, was like, man, like like Dorothy, right? I'm home again. Like, I'm back in Kansas. And and it, it was comfortable. It was fun. It was exhilarating. And then, you know, I get Francine put with me. And, you know, she was just such a, a willing student and phenomenal what she did that it – uh it really, you know, for me, it, it was homecoming for me in more ways than one.